What is the most outlandish statement that Jason Kelly, CEO of Ginkgo Bioworks, has made? I think that this is a very pertinent and relevant question to ask because, unfortunately, pretty much all biotech executives and CEOs, they've had to make very drastic changes to either their business outlook or to other aspects in which they run operations in their business because a lot of times now they're really trying to think about either what's the easiest route to commercialization which can result in some product that they can introduce to the market which would ultimately probably calm investors down the most and reassure and moreover also reassure investors that the company can have some positive contribution within the biotech space and i think in the case of jason kelly it's particularly difficult to answer or to definitively point out which type of statement that he's made throughout his career as the CEO of Ginkgo Bioworks that would be the most outlandish because there are several of his claims that are extremely outlandish in the sense that he claimed, even like along with Mark Dimitrik, that for years they were really close to you know being on the road towards breaking even and profitability when now they're not even, they're farther off from their goal than they expected. And they said that they're expecting to reach the EBITDA break even point around late 2026. I think that I really want to see what Mark is going to say if they don't end up reaching the break even EBITDA point at by late 2026. And what would be his rationale? Because it's pretty much like Mark is making up excuses for years about what he expects the financial performance or the financial trajectory of Ginkgo Bioworks to be. And then it completely, all of his predictions completely end up pretty much falling flat on their face time and time again, while Mark is continuing to cash out on his stock options on Ginkgo Bioworks and not just Mark, pretty much all the executives there. And I really feel like it really draws our attention to the fact as what's the point of making all of these outlandish claims or statements rather than artificially pumping up the value of a company in the short term so that the executives can cash out their stock options. And this is obviously also related to a lot of what the stock, the people and the stock investors and the venture capitalists who gave Ginkgo Bioworks the money to even get there in the first place, what their opinion and perspective on this is. Because I think that they have a very clear rationale because if they gave up so much of their money, like people gave up money and put investments in Ginkgo Bioworks that they could use as a down payment for a condo, or maybe in some you know, parts of the United States, even the down payment for a house or property, why would anyone want to invest into Ginkgo Bioworks for this sham, for what appears to be allegedly a sham, instead of just having a property and being able to live his or her life and just being able to, you know, feel happy with yourself that you have some property you can provide yourself with a roof over your head rather than just giving and pouring all of your hard-earned money into some synthetic biology company that's frankly speaking barely scalable because I really don't even think that Ginkgo Bioworks is their foundry and their bio their biofab one facility that they've really been working hard to invest on the order of millions of dollars to build and get up to speed and renovate I don't really even think that it's as scalable as they think it is. Now, I want to add some caution to that statement because I think in the pharmaceutical space, they're probably the most scalable out of any other department or any other area of the biotech industry that they serve in their foundry because there are really a lot of biotech executives from big pharmaceutical companies that have to meet very strong commercial demands for either different types of products that they're looking to scale up as well as different types of products that they have to pass that they have to pass the clinical trials and other type of regulatory uh, agencies so i think that for that for that aspect of the business i think that probably jason's claims about the ginkgo bioworks foundry in the upcoming facility for the ginkgo bio the ginkgo bioworks biofab one they're probably more aligned to reality because he had to have a lot of meetings and the Ginkgo Bioworks executives also had to talk a lot with these people not only to reassure them that their foundry is scalable and can continue to uh, improve uh, with scale from their scale economics but also from the fact that they can actually maybe 
help these big pharmaceuticals uh, pass, you know, pass on to them some very uh, helpful, you know, or informative assays that can fare well in later stages of the regulatory process. So, yeah, I, th I would say probably that if we were to definitively point to one type of statement that Jason Kelly has made that's very outlandish, it's all it's kind of very difficult because that's what I've been talking about, you know, in a lot of videos on my YouTube channel. But I would say that probably the statement that they with regards to the timeline in which they expect the foundry to break even with respect to EBITDA uh, that Mark Dimitrik has been reporting on time and time again in different quarterly updates for Ginkgo Bioworks. I really feel like those are probably more of the risky and controversial statements from the fact that it's really hard for them to even break even because associated with breaking even in EBITDA is the fact that they have to still pour in millions of dollars, several millions of dollars every quarter just to get their next facility up that can get them closer to this break even EBITDA point or the EBITDA break even point. And I feel that maybe they probably don't even include what kind of R&D expenses that they have to waste or, you know, I don't know, waste, but you know, like they have to spend and burn through the cash uh, to be able to even get the Biofab 1 facility up to speed. So I really think that Jason, he should provide more perspective on how they're trying to, how they're planning on, or how they're expecting to be able to reach this EBITDA break-even point by late 2026. And furthermore, moreover, on top of this, why did they have to change so much of their metrics so many times? And how are they going to reassure us uh, from the people looking outside in on Gink on the operations of Ginkgo Bioworks that this current mass layoff that they did isn't really going to uh, interfere significantly with the scale up and uh, the increase in productivity of different uh, synthetic biology and uh, other biological projects that they're looking at.